Today on Unworthy History, we'll be reading some actual history from the following book. The Capture and Escape, Life Among the Sioux by Sarah L. Larimer. This book was published all the way back in 1870. So today is episode 7 in my series on Fanny Kelly. Now back in episode 4, the night before Fanny Kelly was condemned to die by the chief, she found Sarah Larimer and her son had gone missing. And in this episode, we will hear from Sarah Larimer's perspective about what happened to them after they disappeared. Two hours were spent in this beautiful camp when we proceeded upon the journey in a northern direction. After traveling ten miles, we again found water, and they all halted to rest a little and quench their thirst. The sun was fast sinking in the west. With a feeble hope of being overtaken by friends, I pleaded fatigue, and asked the privilege of remaining by the brook until the next morning. But my entreaties were disregarded, they having determined to proceed several miles up the valley before stopping for their night's encampment. We traveled until after dark. The third camp was in a secluded nook of the valley. It was entered at the base of a succession of bluffs and rocky peaks that almost surrounded it. Amid these encircling hills it lay, a small meadow watered by a little brook. Or possibly it was a creek of some size in other seasons of the year, but now it was almost dry. The enclosure was dotted by numerous bushes that were covered by green foliage. The moon set early and in the dim starlight could be seen the frowning bluffs that shut us in on every side like the grim walls of a fortress. Our carriage horses were brought in and as I looked upon them their familiar faces were like the countenances of dear old friends and the thought of their services through so many years and through our journeyings on the plains rushed through my memory. It was the last look at those dear, faithful creatures who, like us, were introduced to a wild, roving life. Bushes were cut off at the ground and placed in a circular and conical form, meeting at the top, and over them coverings were stretched, making them comfortable shelters, each large enough for one person to repose in. One of these little teepees furnished with some bedding was placed at my disposal, and taking my child in my arms, I retired. Frank, being weary with his fatiguing journey, soon fell asleep. The thirty hours of our peril and privations had made sorrow painfully apparent upon his dear little face. Yet, true to my injunctions, not a tear trembled in his eyes, nor a word of complaint passed his lips, nor glance of impatience darkened his brow, but quiet sorrow was impressed on every feature, while the cheerful brightness of his eyes seemed quenched when he sat in silent thoughtfulness. I had from the first endeavored to gain the confidence of the Indians, and caused them to believe that we were resigned to our fate, that their vigilance relaxing a chance for escape might present itself. Several small fires were made in the camp which gave it a cheerful appearance, and by each of these a guard was stationed. One being burning near the door of my little teepee, a guard was near us. The child lay peacefully sleeping, and I silently watching and waiting until between midnight and the morning, when all being still, I arose noiselessly and looked out at the scene. The fires had burned low, and the guards appeared to slumber, overcome doubtless by the fatigue of the previous day's march, and lulled to carelessness by our apparent resignation to our fate, and the knowledge of the distance we were from the fort. Softly stepping, lest my foot should touch the slumbering form of an Indian, I made my way to the place I thought my friend and fellow prisoner Mrs. Kelly lay, her bed having been made in the open air. But in the darkness I could not distinguish one figure from another, and fearing I would be discovered if I endeavored to search closely, remembering too that she had said in the evening she would endeavor to take a horse that night and go back, I hoped she had succeeded, and I retraced my steps to the door of my shelter. A terrible sense of isolation overcame me. No one can realize the sensation without in some degree experiencing it. In the heart of a wilderness a thousand miles from home, and a prisoner in the camp of a band of hostile Indians, with but a life of slavish wanderings for myself and child, there was but one glimpse of light in this darkness, and that was flight. 
but between the camp and the civilized world were many difficulties. To pass the guards, to keep points of the compass in the trackless wilderness, pursuers to elude, hunger and thirst to endure, possibly ravenous beasts of prey and venomous reptiles to encounter. To remain was a life of bondage and the companionship of barbarous Indians. I resolved to make an attempt to escape, and snatching the child he awoke and I lifted him from the bed. Fearing that he might be only partially awakened and become frightened, I whispered, I am about for starting for home, and clasping him closely in my arms, I looked around to discover any danger. All was quiet, not a sound save the breathing of the sleepers broke the silence. A few dim stars shone above the rocky peaks that surrounded us. Pressing him to my bosom in unspoken assurance of my fearless resolution to save him, I stepped noiselessly but rapidly across the camp to the place where we had entered it, and in precaution, instead of turning to the south by the way we had come, I climbed a bluff to the westward hoping in this way to evade our pursuers. This bluff was succeeded by another, and still others, which I climbed until my strength failed, under the laborious labor and weight of my child, and I could carry him no further. Then, placing him upon the ground, I adjured him to run and climb for his life. He realized the necessity of doing this, and brought all his energies to the task. Thus we traveled in a southwesterly direction until morning. Judging it unsafe to travel in daylight, we sought a canyon, and concealed ourselves under the side of a projecting rock, where we remained in silent watchfulness until late in the afternoon. But although secreted from our Indian foes who had discovered our absence at early dawn, and instituted a search which lasted until almost noon, a scarcely less terrible enemy in the form of thirst seized us, threatening our lives. Of hunger we had no consciousness, although it was a fast from seven meals, but water became the one absorbing thought. In it, even our danger from the Indians was forgotten. Mother, said little Frank, as we were traveling the previous day, I would rather go up to God than to go with the Indians. But when his lips became parched, his throat dry, his tongue protruding, so that he could scarcely speak, he said, Mother, we might as well have been killed by the Indians as to die of thirst in this canyon and he seemed to sink as a fading flower under the midday sun. In childhood, I had listened to my grandmother's stories of Indian cruelties, while at night my dreams had been haunted with the horrible phantoms of those recitals. To prevent my boy's brain becoming a prey to equally dreary visions, I had forbidden such narratives being related in the presence of Frank, but it was reserved for him to taste the reality of those dreadful legends, and realize the bitterness of fear I had shrunk from in description. Crouched in the shadow of our rock of refuge, endeavoring to console the child with cheering stories and assurances that water would be at last obtained, I thought of many characters in romance and history wherein the Indian is enshrined in beauty, the untutored nobility of the soul, the brave and lofty spirit, the simple dignity untrammeled by the ceremonies of a hollow world, with many other traits of noble character attributed to him, rose mockingly before me, in strange contrast with the realities we had just escaped from. The stately Logan, the fearless Philip, the invincible Tecumseh, the bold Black Hawk, and the gentle Pocahontas. How unlike the greedy, cunning, and ruthless Indians we had seen! Truly those pictures of the children of the forest that adorn the pages of the novelist are delightful conceptions of the airy fancy fitted to charm the mind. They amuse and beguile the hour, but the true Indian roams his native waste, and to study his real character so much must be sacrificed that few persons become really acquainted with him. By some, a remarkable sagacity is attributed to the Indian. It is even said that they can discern footprints upon a rock, and follow scents of footsteps upon the ground. But these ideas are dreams of fancy. The Indians cultivate the powers of the eye and the ear, and arrive at a great degree of acuteness in those organs, which, however, might be equally the possession of any other people. Indeed, their custom of plucking out the eyebrows and lashes, thus exposing the pupils to sun and dust might be supposed to be injurious to the eyes.
Late in the afternoon, when our thirst had become almost intolerable, fearing Frank's sufferings for water would disable him for travel, his strength already fading, I concluded to go from our place of concealment and endeavor to view the face of the country, and accordingly I cautiously stepped over the sand to the base of a huge rock, and I ventured to climb its craggy side until I could overlook the surrounding country, but could see no living creature. The Indian camp had been left several miles to the northeastward, and the bluffs over which we had traveled intervening effectually concealed the valley from view. The surrounding country seemed a vast pile of sand, interspersed with huge rocks productive of nothing but sagebush and cactus, the former growing from a few inches to several feet in height, and literally covering the country for miles in extent. This herb is used by the Indians for fuel. It is somewhat like the cultivated sage having a strong taste that resembles the flavor of that herb. Its prolific growth, however, was almost equaled in some sections by the cactus, which covered the ground for miles in extent, and its numerous formidable thorns repel intrusion wherever it spreads. Returning to Frank and my fears for his failing strength arousing me to the necessity of procuring water, I resolved to leave the canyon for that purpose. He was anxious to make every effort his strength would permit, and we began to climb the rocks at the side of the canyon opposite our place of entrance, with the view of leaving still another obstacle between us and the Indian's camp. Here a whip and lash were found, proving that the place had been visited before. A little squirrel came frisking along, and on discovering us seemed amazed to see intruders there, and after a few glances with its bright little eyes, it whisked away among the rocks and sand from whence it came. Then a little bird alighted upon a point, and fluttered about in quest of something that it did not find, soon winging its way to another place, leaving a solitude to us. We began to ascend the craggy height, and soon stood upon its summit, but the work of descending was not a trifling undertaking and required some time and patience. When the ground was reached, we immediately started to the southeastward, with a hope of arriving at the valley we had left in the morning, a few miles south of the Indian camp. But now a painful reality interposed. When escaping the camp, having not worn my shoes but carrying them in my hand, hoping in this way to avoid leaving tracks in the sand, I had, in the darkness, walked into a vast bed of cactus, rife with thorns, which had penetrated my feet in a very painful manner. On the discovery of the pitiless thorns, I had caught the child up and carried him through, thus saving him the pain he otherwise must have suffered, and disregarding the piercing needles had hastened on. Possibly it was there that our pursuers were eluded, for it was not deemed probable that any person would undertake to cross an unknown bed of cactus. Now when I pressed my feet to the ground, the thorns caused no little pain. Frank, sympathizing with me in this torture, begged that I would endeavor to forget it in the recollection of the urgent necessity of traveling, as he had found his thirst grow more intense by dwelling upon it. After a walk of several miles, we arrived at the valley where we had hoped to find water, but alas, the stream had sunk under the surface, leaving, however, some wet mud in the bed of the creek. At this disappointment, Frank wept, for his thirst was intense, but heaven and mercy suggested a plan by which a few drops of the delicious liquid might be obtained. Frank wore two shirts. I divested him of one, and by placing some of the moist earth in it, and pressing it with my hands, a few drops of water were obtained, which fell like pearls into the mouth of the child. It was a most welcome draft, although muddy and much impregnated with iron. It brought back the life that seemed ebbing under the torture of thirst. According to the geographical account of the country, this was probably the head of Sage Creek. Abundance of tall grass grew in the valley, and a few rose bushes were scattered upon the little knolls that dotted it, and though the season for roses was almost over, a few were left blooming. We followed the stream, or rather the valley, for one or two miles, and could see the prints of footsteps of birds in the moist earth, as they too had searched for water. Nothing of animal life was seen except a deer that leaped from its covert at our approach, and escaped over the hills.
Finally, we came to a little pool of water that tenaciously held its position in the bed of the creek. Its surface was covered by a green scum, and innumerable little snakes darted about on seeing us approach, and seemed by their hasty movements of swimming from shore to shore, lapping their slender tongues, darting keen glances from their gleaming little eyes, to resent our approach. We, however, were persevering, and in spite of their hostile demonstrations and hurried movements, advanced to the brink, and stooped to drink of the tempting liquid, first, however, taking the precaution of frightening the reptiles away, and spreading a cloth upon the surface, and we only drank of what was strained through lest we might swallow some tiny reptiles. Further down the valley, more water was found, but soon the creek, with its lovely green, turned to the eastward, and we were compelled to leave it and pursue our way southward, over the dry and desolate hills. The sun was fast sinking behind the western peaks, and we only awaited the friendly shadows of night to pursue our way over the wild and arid heights before us, not daring to venture in daylight lest the watchful eye of a wary Indian should detect our movements. Having procured some moist earth and a cloth for its dampness, and in case no water could be found on the road, we treasured it as a preserver of life. While sitting in a sheltered retreat awaiting the sun's decline, we observed to the northward a small party of Indians advancing, but apparently unconscious of our presence in the vicinity. They were at a distance of several hundred yards and were not recognized as being of the party we had escaped from. Our only safety was in concealment. Cautiously, we crept to some large bunches of sagebrush and were shielded by their protecting leaves. Yet painful suspense was endured as the Indians approached and passed just within a few yards of us. As night spread her sable mantle over the hills, bringing coolness and repose to the weary, the young moon shone faintly, and a few stars could be seen, but silence reigned. Not even a sound of the murmur of water or hum of insects could be heard upon the clear air. I arose and felt in the darkness for the child. He slept where last I saw him. It was cruel to disturb that needed rest, yet many miles of weary walking lay between us and our own people. With a silent prayer to God for protection, I awoke him, and we proceeded upon the journey. As we ascended the hills, the wind arose, blowing fresh and cold. We continued to walk all night, looking stealthily on every side for the approach of danger, and expecting at any moment that we might overtake the band that had passed us in the evening. Just before daybreak, the darkness was intense and the way so rugged that it was deemed advisable to wait until morning, which would give a view of our surroundings. Accordingly, we went aside a few steps to seek a hiding place beneath the shelter of some sage bush. Soon, my weary child fell asleep, but the intense anxiety for water prevented me from finding rest. We had seen no signs of water since we left Sage Creek, and it might yet be days before it could be obtained. The horrors of our situation were harassing to contemplate, and once a thought of returning to the pool we had left presented itself. But reason coming to aid a better resolution, the cowardly suggestion was banished, and as the first rays of daylight tinged the eastern horizon, I arose to look upon the surrounding country. The wolves seemed congregated upon the highlands, and awaking from their night's repose, their wailing cries echoed back from the distant hills with terrific clearness. These prowling creatures abound in that country where some species attain a great size. They congregate in large numbers, attacking the stray animals that they happen to meet. Even the buffalo, which does not fear them in the herd, knows his danger when overtaken alone, and the solitary bull, secreted from its hunter, succumbs before the united force of a gang of wolves. Advantage is sometimes taken of the unsuspecting buffalo by the Indian, who covers himself with a wolf skin and, creeping cautiously, is permitted to approach within a few yards of the herd, when he is able to discharge his arrows with deadly effect. In this way, great slaughter is sometimes made by the cunning Indians. Each secures a piece of meat for present use, leaving the carcass to become a feast for the wolves, thus wasting their own game. 
When the day became clear, a green valley could be seen to the southward, and dreading the agony of thirst that Frank might suffer, I concluded to mark the place and proceed in search of water alone. Being soon convinced that the hope was not delusive, and that it really could be obtained, I returned for Frank, and to my horror could not find the spot where I had left him. The direction was not lost, but in my eagerness I had traveled further than I had anticipated. For a while I searched with anxious dread, with frantic ardor hastening through the sage bushes, but a great sameness prevailed, each place appearing much like another. At length he awoke, and finding himself alone, stood up and cried. My joy was great, for truly the lost was found. Together we hastened into the valley, and on the way thither came into a deserted Indian camp, and from its relics selected a pair of abandoned moccasins, which being bound upon Frank's bruised and bleeding feet, served as a shield to protect them from the scorching sand. Farther in the valley, covered with a luxuriant growth of grass, we found a creek flowing over a bed of unusually white sand. This water was very cold, and though of the depth of two feet, it was so clear that it appeared to be but a mere ripple above the sand. This section was evidently a great Indian rendezvous, and lest we be observed, it was necessary to seek a secluded place in which to spend the day. Looking about, we discovered the mouth of a small creek that emptied into this stream from the southwest. Thither we went, and found the waters, though occupying so nearly the same section of the country, to be in great contrast with the first creek, one being of icy coldness and clear as crystal, the other warm and stagnant and of a greenish color. With a conviction that the Indians would probably make their encampments near the best water and most luxuriant grass, we selected our secluded retreat for the day near the other. This temporary home was a cavity in the side of a bluff, rising perpendicularly from the valley at the southward. It had been formed by the action of water that flowed from the hills into the valley in wet seasons. It was of oval shape and about 30 feet in length with perpendicular walls on either side, which were about 20 feet high and 12 feet apart. The mouth was a narrow passage which had been formed by the outward flow of water through a rock, and in this natural doorway grew clusters of wild rose bushes which concealed the entrance from view, and just beyond the door was a pool of water that, like a good fairy, promised to keep away the bane of thirst. This seemed like a tolerably safe retreat, as long as our tracks should not be discovered and guide the Indians to our seclusion. The sun arose in all its majestic beauty. Not a cloud intervened to obscure the golden rays as they tinged the tops of lofty peaks and nestled into silent nooks, thus overspreading the vast arid hills. Not even a bird was seen to soar or flit upward, and but the murmur of the sparkling brook broke the silence of that long and ever-to-be-remembered day. The pool of water near our door was of a green color, and inhabited by slender, dark-colored reptiles, which very much resembled horses' hairs, and were supposed to be tiny roots until a closer observation revealed the truth that instead of floating by the action of the water, they possessed animal life, and had eyes, and looking at us, curved their slender form seeming to resent our approach. Looking about in the hope of finding a rosebud, an empty eggshell was discovered, from which the little warbler had winged its flight, and upon this we dined. This eggshell proved to be the only meal that broke our fast of four days. Later in the day, when on a cautious visit to the neighboring pool, we discovered a very large toad sitting in the grass, pouting silently, as though pondering over some great wrong. Frogs are eaten by civilized people, but toads never, nor will the Indians use them for food. Their appearance is repulsive and disagreeable to such an extent as to lead to the belief that they are a poisonous reptile. Yet it has been said that some soldiers during the Revolutionary War in great extremity ate them. This toad we captured and carried triumphantly to our cave, and we resolved that whatever its exterior homeliness might be, it should serve as a shield against a day of starvation. To kill it without a weapon was now a matter of consideration, and finally a little stick was procured and used vigorously, but the reptile clung tenaciously to life, and only yielded under repeated blows. It finally lay dead upon its breast. 
Yet we refrain from eating it, reserving it for a greater emergency, our prejudices not being easily overcome. Some rose leaves and the small game were secured in our pockets, and at night some moist earth was placed in a cloth, for it might be a refreshing balm in the absence of water. Slowly the sun went down, and night hovered over the hills as we resumed our journey. More hills were to be climbed. Soon we discover that the mud we carried in the cloth would not retain moisture, and in consequence was worthless. We had now been long fasting, and the absence of food aggravated our thirst. The country was high and barren, and no signs of water being discovered, a fear that none could be obtained haunted us as night wore on. At length the child's strength failed to such a degree that he could walk but a few steps in succession, and then must rest a little. He begged to be permitted to lie down, but I knew it would be unsafe to travel in daylight, and fearing Frank would not survive the next day unless water be procured, I endeavored to encourage him onward, reminding him of the weary hours of the previous night, how we had traveled over sandy heights and dreary wastes to find at morning dawn water and rest. Now the night was far spent, and soon a new day would come when we would probably be as fortunate as before. A large white flower nodded gracefully on its slender stalk, and seemed a reminder of the poppy in the garden of our Pennsylvania home. Its dwelling place was among the mountains where it stood blooming alone, seeming by its contentment and beauty to mock our starvings. I plucked it for its moisture and fragrance and offered it to Frank, but he declined it, remarking, I do not care for flowers now. And trembling under the influence of fatigue, hunger, and thirst, his husky voice and pleading eyes again begged for rest. I was unable to carry him, and could but realize the painful truth that his strength was exhausted. I sought a small wash in the ground, and taking him in my arms, lay down and fell asleep. Soon the day dawned when the shrill voices of the wolves rang upon the clear morning air, rousing us to a sense of immediate danger. A little sleep had revived the child somewhat. We arose and, contrary to our previous intentions, began to travel in daylight. The danger being divided and it being scarcely less terrible to risk the withering influence of thirst and the attack of ferocious wolves in our seclusion than the Indians in travel, the former evil was almost certain, and as our way was not to the place of our attack which the Indians would most likely suspect, we hoped to elude the latter and proceeded on our lonely walk. It was not exclusively a time of suffering, for though cast out, as it were, from the world, there was a magnificent scenery to enjoy, a grand panorama spread in majestic beauty before us, yet not as splendid as is that sometimes seen in this mountainous country where the most sublime objects in nature are crowded into a scene as wild and beautiful as imagination can picture. The rarity of the atmosphere nowhere more inviting than on the vast slopes and plateaus of the Rocky Mountains gives to everything a mystic beauty. Small objects close at hand start up with remarkable rapidity into gigantic monsters. A raven at a short distance looks like some large animal, and when the deception is discovered recalls to mind the monster birds described by Sinbad the sailor. And the far-off buttes mock with their retreatings the approach of the traveler, who, thinking that a moment's ride will bring him to a landmark, a pool of fresh water, or some approaching stranger, travels onward, while the visions sink one by one behind the horizon, above which refraction has raised them. Sometimes a solitary antelope walking alone will be multiplied into a band of twenty, and a small herd of seven or eight looks like the march of a band of Indians, causing fears lest they be pursuers. Sometimes the Artemisia patches, rocks, and alkaline flats covered with the incrustation of alkali sparkling in the sun suddenly seem to vibrate before the eyes and transform themselves into lakes and gardens of the most bewildering beauty, then, with a misty vapor, they pass away, leaving the barren plain in its blank sterility as before, a desolation covered with artemisia or buffalo sage and prickly pear patches that add little beauty to the surrounding desolation. Still, over the desert-like wilderness, the antelope roams in vast numbers, and the huge bison flounders in comparative security. Sailing in mystic curves, the American eagle surveys the plains, unconscious of danger, 
or swoops with fearful rapidity upon the unsuspecting rabbit or sage hen and bears it to his eyrie with a triumphant scream. About nine o'clock we descended to the bed of a creek or shallow river, whose waters had all disappeared beneath the sand, or under the influence of evaporation as is not uncommon in that country in dry seasons. A green tree could be seen down the stream, standing like a forest king, spreading its branches to the weary traveler of these desolate hills. When we had crossed this sandy creek and gained the opposite bluff, great smoky hills could be seen to the southward, looming up against the morning sky and adding their wild grandeur to the surrounding scene. Soon a green valley of thirty miles width spread out before us, and through it rolled a mighty river whose windings amid verdant banks could be marked from our elevation, and the emerald spots of luxuriant green that dotted the silvery crest were visible upon its bosom, while the rays of the July sun were reflected back from its glassy surface in dazzling splendor. Those hills were a spur of the Rocky Mountains and are said to derive their smoky appearance from the burning of bituminous coal in which they abound. The great river was the North Platte, and although miles of weary walking lay between us and its cool waves, and even when gained it might be too much swollen to ford, the prospect of relief from thirst and the consciousness of being thus far on our homeward journey brought renewed hope. The road lay over great sandy hills, and the scorching sun seemed to wither all vegetation under its influence. Frank's hat and my bonnet had been left behind, and our heads were exposed to the hot rays of the sun. I had undertaken to make temporary caps, but being warned by Frank that white could be seen at a great distance, and might lead to discovery just when hope had sprung into our hearts, I desisted, thankfully accepting his suggestion. On ascending another eminence, what appeared to be an Indian village resting upon the opposite bank of the river presented itself in bold relief, and to the eastward at the distance of a few miles, another village was located between us and the river, as if guarding the blessed refreshing liquid. It was death to retrace our steps, and dangerous to go forward. One moment in that exposed place might cost us our lives or a recapture. Our position was on the brink of a precipice, and at its base could be seen a clear pool or lake that had formed from the superabundance of the river, but that was beyond our reach, over 200 feet below, while its cool and tempting freshness only increased the desire to be at its brink. There was but one thought which came like a flash, safety, and a moment later we were concealed from the danger amid the gaping walls of a canyon's mouth that opened immediately to our right, as if to offer a shelter that otherwise we could not have found. It was entered by a gradually descending slope for a few feet, and then a narrow passage between two rocks seemed to open for us to pass, and down into its cool declivity we went. Strong and high, the massive rocks rose above us, and we seemed buried alive in the bowels of the earth. Nothing grander than this mighty canyon did my eyes ever rest upon, and feeble words can convey but a faint impression of the wondrous beauty of this noble feat of nature. After reaching a gentle slope, we came to a steep descent of stones, resembling stair steps without the aid of which it would have been impossible to penetrate its depths. The greater space below, when gained, resembled the cell of some old prison, and in it we felt more severed from the breathing, thinking world. Passing still further down this canyon, for it was long and seemingly divided into rooms or apartments, we came to a natural hall, paved with smooth rock and overhung with arched walls, gray and rough and garnished with curious devices. Beautiful white stones of various shapes and sizes decorated this place, being disposed around in grotesque shapes and exquisite harmony of order. Even weariness, fear, and thirst did not deaden the faculties beyond the power of enjoying this masterpiece of nature's cunning worksmanship, on which she had lavished so much skillful tracery, to rear a palace for the abode of silence, for not a sound broke the quiet, whose solemn presence was felt if not seen. The way went over rocks, and cautiously we went across places that our feet were the first to press. It was now twenty-two hours since we had tasted water, and we seemed to sink under the influence of thirst. The way had been over a dry, sandy waste that was scorching under the sun, 
Now the cooling shades of the towering walls on either side were as a refreshing balm, but could not supply the need of water, and that became the one absorbing thought. Water in the river, water in the well, water at the fount, water in the lake, water everywhere. After resting a while, a descending slope was discovered and we proceeded. We soon came to where the floor was of sand, and a great tree presented itself in bold relief, but appeared in its prison walls as a tree of insignificant growth. At this place the sand was damp, and immediately at the right was the mouth of another mighty canyon which, with a hope of finding water, we entered. And though this new wonder presented fearful forebodings, it also gave hope. We hurried onward, inspired with a growing certainty that water would be found, and soon came to a pool of bright, clear, cold water, the best of liquids. During that long night and day, it had seemed that if once it was within our grasp, our thirst would be insatiable, never tiring of the refreshing stream. It was more than 100 hours since we had last eaten food, yet we were not conscious of a desire for it. This canyon was in great contrast with its sister that we had just visited, everything being damp. The sand beneath our feet was moist, great pools of water stood here and there, and occasionally a stream rippled along and then sank into the porous strata of sand, to rise again in pools, or to flow along at the base of the mighty walls and mingle with the drops that dripped from their sides. This canyon, though not so grotesque, was truly beautiful, and in it were marks of former intrusion. A boot track and a print of a horseshoe were discovered in the sand. Indians do not wear boots, nor are their horses shod. A hope, not a delusive hope, sprang to our breasts. We had previously heard the tinkling of a bell and the lowing of a cow, but had supposed they belonged to the Indians of the neighboring village. But now it seemed a proof in connection with the tracks that possibly civilized people were in the vicinity. Hastening back to the dry canyon, I ascended the side and looked eagerly for any assurance of the vicinity of a civilized person. Again the lowing of a cow as pleasant music broke the silence, for it carried with it hope. Indians only steal cattle for their meat. We felt that we must be near the camp of Christian people. Hastening to Frank, I took his hand and ascended the opposite side, which, since the junction of the canyons was a huge embankment of sand, even roots and bushes were interspersed. Freshly chopped wood was found upon the side. There a hunter had been. I left my child believing the mark sufficient to secure my finding him again, and climbing still higher I caught a glimpse of the valley we had so long been approaching. Knowing our danger from the Indians that roamed the hills, every possible assurance that civilized people were really in the neighborhood was necessary, lest with a delusive thought we might rush into danger. A cloud of dust arose beyond the river and sailed along as though it was being raised by a little whirlwind from a public highway. The village could be seen, but it was at too great a distance for the people to be recognized as Indians. The lowing of cows, the tinkling bell, the tracks in the sand, cut wood, the dust as of a highway, all rose up as evidences of a vicinity to white people. Possibly a train was encamped near the Indian village. Perhaps we were nearing the emigrant road and much nearer to the fort than had been supposed. Calculating the distance we had been taken by the Indians and the way we had come in returning, we had not hoped to strike a frequented road for 10 miles beyond the Platte River. But now the cheering evidences of our vicinity to civilized life combined formed an illuminating light such as had not been shown before in our saddened minds, and just as the last ray of the glorious sunset died on the tops of the surrounding hills, the clear soft sound of music floated through the still air and lingered upon the rocks to echo back the enrapturing notes. And at that moment an eagle with widespread wings sailed proudly aloft into the dying sunset. At the sight of the noble bird and the sound of our nation's horn, danger seemed to fly, and I bounded down the rocky steep to carry the good tidings to my son. He too had caught the sound, and with hope and joy beaming in his eyes exclaimed, The soldiers, Ma, I hear the bugle sound retreat. It was truly so, and clasping my dear child in my arms, we rejoiced together. 
Having bathed and combed at the pool, no future preparations were to be made, and we proceeded to the mouth of the United Canyons by a passage between two precipitous bluffs that led several hundred feet downward to the river. Arriving on the bank of the stream under the cover of night, we sought the shelter of some bushes, for the mighty river rolled between us and the fort. The village we had seen on the north side was some little distance below us, and we still believed it to be inhabited by Indians who would capture or murder us immediately on discovery. Caution had been learned through bitter experience, and although there were so many evidences of our vicinity to a friendly settlement, we dreaded lest a lurking Indian discovering us at the threshold of friends, for we felt that we were surely approaching the place of a white man, we still cautiously avoided exploring a path that might be beset with dangers. As we sat in this shelter, which proved to be the last, a most joyful and welcome sound greeted our ears, one in which there was no mistake, our own language, spoken by some boys who passed driving cattle. We arose at the pleasant and encouraging sound in the sight of the boys, and believing that what we had supposed was an Indian village might be an emigrant train, walked slowly in that direction, and soon saw a man who was approaching with two horses and called to him. He came forward, and I inquired if he was a white emigrant, when he proudly raised his head and said, Well, I believe I am. Then I endeavored to explain to him why I thus unceremoniously addressed him, but he interrupted me by saying, Oh yes, I have already heard of the Indian's outbreak, and that you were carried away, but no one ever dreamed of your coming back by yourself. Two companies of soldiers have arrived at Deer Creek, just beyond the river, on their way to chastise those scoundrels. But come along with me, and I will take you to the train where there are ladies. And still holding my hand, he drew us with him. As you are acquainted with the circumstances, can you tell me where the men of our train are? I inquired. Your husband, he replied, was wounded, although not fatally, and he is beyond the river in the fort. This was the first intimation I had that any of our train had been shot when the Indians fired, and in hope that some mistake existed I made further inquiries, but the kind man knew the truth, and having heard of a little boy being carried away, and seeing Frank knew it was my husband that was convalescent, and proceeded to explain. We soon arrived at the place where the women were, and were introduced and cordially welcomed. Never before was I so glad to see ladies. They were of course all strangers to me, but notwithstanding they seemed as sisters. While some laughed, others cried, each in her way expressing joy at our return. Their interest and sympathy were like healing balm after our dreary wanderings among the hills. It was regarded as but little less than a miracle that we had made our escape from the Indians entirely unaided, and successfully found our way back. Very soon hundreds of persons flocked to see us, and inquire in what manner we had effected an escape, and how we found our way back to that point. Many of these good people were Germans, and as they conversed among themselves expressed a very great hatred of the Indians. I felt almost persuaded that they were as much embittered against the Indians as myself. For an hour this entertainment lasted, and though I felt weary and faint, I endeavored to reply correctly to all their questions, although it seemed an unceasing stream of inquiries. This train had come from Iowa, and the river being very high, they had been unable to cross until they arrived at that place, and were awaiting a fall in the water. Numerous small trains coming up, the encampment was increased to a great size, and upon first sight the covered wagons appeared like an Indian village. Thus arose my first impression that this was an Indian camp. With great kindness a sumptuous supper was prepared, but although our fasts had been long, we felt no desire for food, and I declined to accept anything but a cup of tea and a small piece of bread, and permitted Frank to only have a little milk and rice, at the taste of which his appetite returned, but mine did not, until tempted by delicacies prepared by kind ladies at the fort on the second day after our arrival. As the waters were too high for us to cross that night, a soldier by the name of Sparks, who happened to be there, kindly offered to cross the river, and inform my husband of our safe arrival. Then Mr. Kelly immediately came over to inquire the fate of his family, but I was able to give him no very encouraging information. 
The afflicted husband and father's emotion on listening to what I could tell was a sight that moved strong hearts. His wife, still in captivity, with all the horrors of uncertainty surrounding her, and his little daughter alone upon the hills, or carried away by another party, or perhaps mutilated and left for wolves to prey upon. All this seemed to press heavily upon his mind and feelings. Endurance struggled with stronger sentiment, but the great sorrow that oppressed his heart did not prevent him from sympathizing with our joy, and he related the particulars of the condition of the wounded, and assured me that my husband was convalescent. Avowing his intention to start the next morning in search of his lost child, he returned to the fort and the bedside of the wounded men. So that's it for this episode. This was really quite a remarkable escape from their Sioux captors by Sarah Larimer and her son Frank. It took them about four days and with no weapons or food and very little water. So in the next episode in this series, we'll get back to Fanny Kelly, who is still in captivity. So if you want to see more episodes like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.